Now I want to start chapter two on key concepts and calculations. It's important that students persist right to the end of the chapter in order to gain a mastery in the key calculations they'll be showing you, but also in the nutrition concepts. This slide will provide you with the key goals that you want to achieve in this chapter. First, know the metric system call. Practice it back and forth. Second, memorize the Mifflin equation. It's too simple not to memorize. Memorize male and female equations and practice uh, completing the Mifflin equation in about 40 seconds flat. If you're able to do that, you'll do really well in all the rest of the quizzes in this, chap in this uh, course. Um, create a cheat sheet for the Gary equation and then practice it. Uh, not writing out the equation extensively, but visualizing it from your cheat sheet and practice putting in the values as indicated by your cheat sheet and practice getting that job done in about 75 seconds. If you're able to do these two, Mifflin and Gary equation, and practice it to that extent, you will do really well. B plus, A minus, and A in this class. Next, memorize the um, healthy ranges for protein, for carbohydrate, and for fat. And know and memorize, of course, the cutoffs for total sugar, for added sugar, for polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, saturated fat, and for sodium. So these are all in the chapters as well as in this particular lecture. So I ask you to concentrate on those. These are critical cutoffs that you should retain for the entirety of the semester. Here's a slide that will help you sort of remember what are the key metric conversions that you need to know. Well, for this class, really one gram, 1,000 milligrams, one pound, 454 grams, one pound would also be 0 0.454 kilograms, one kilogram, 2.2 pounds, and one kilogram, 1,000 grams, and finally one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. These will, in particular, the height, one inch, 2.54 centimeters, the one pound equals 454 grams or 0 0.454 kilograms, are the ones that we're going to use most extensively when we actually um, assess metabolic energy requirements of individuals because we use equations that call on the metric system. So we're going to have to convert pounds in weight into kilograms, uh, height in inches into centimeters, as well as into meters. So consequently, one inch equals 2.54 centimeters also means one inch is equal to 0 0.0254 meters. Memorize these cold and practice using them efficiently. Now, the first concept that I will look at is the fact that um, that chronic disease represents a heavy price tag in the United States. 2008 statistics tagged chronic disease or the management of it at 147 billion per year. So there's currently belief that dietary and lifestyle modifications can help minimize uh, the impact of chronic disease in American society and in fact around the world. The consequence of this chronic disease viewed at a population level is that the high prevalence of diseases like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes translate into astronomical healthcare costs over the life of a patient. It also translates into greater morbidity, disability and mortality in the population. NIH data clearly supports that chronic disease is indeed costly at a financial level, certainly, but in terms of human life as well. Um, deaths resulting from the diseases of the heart are the most prevalent in the population, and coming up very closely in second position is cancer and then third stroke. Then we see the others drop chronic respiratory diseases, unintended injuries, and so forth. But the top three heart disease, cancer and stroke, most significant causes of death in the U.S. population. 
The second concept is that the most significant contributor to secondary diseases in the United States is obesity. It's responsible for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, currently representing about 8% of adults, and in 2050 expected to grow to about 33% of adult Americans. We see sleep apnea, gastrointestinal diseases, diverticulosis, gallbladder disease, we see degenerative disorders like arthritis and asthma, and we see the prevalence of some cancers. In fact, more than 75% of the trillions of healthcare costs went towards the management of chronic disease in 2005. Nutrition comes into play at different levels and different intensities. There are diseases which, in which nutrition plays some kind of a role, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and some cancers as well. But there are diseases with strong nutritional components, very heavily associated, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and obesity, very, very highly correlated with nutrition. And then there are specific nutrition diseases, which we'll see later in the textbook. But suffice to say that diseases like pellagra, scurvy, iron deficiency anemia, other vitamins and mineral deficiencies become quite prevalent, and nutrient toxicities as well become relevant to nutrition, especially when we talk about supplementation or maybe um, exaggerated supplementation. Now, the link between obesity and cancer is actually surprisingly quite elevated. 14 to 20 percent of all cancer deaths are apparently tied to being overweight and obese, and up to 33 percent of cancer deaths uh, linked to some kind of a nutritional link. When we put lifestyle in there, we find that 59 percent of cancer deaths in women, and specifically 45 percent of cancer deaths in men, are tagged to diet and lifestyle combined together. One of the ways the government uh, achieves or attempts to achieve a modification in disease rates in the population is to formulate or devise the dietary guidelines for Americans. And they're formulated every five years by the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, and by the Department of Health and Human Services. And really the goal is to identify the key dietary as well as lifestyle issues that need to be addressed for the population disease reduction to take place. And these guidelines really represent a practical, hands-on way of achieving part of the healthy people's goals. Now I want to explore what I mean by nutrients. Well, nutrients are macronutrients, micronutrients, and water. All of these are considered nutrients in a global sense. Now the macronutrients are the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the fat, and you can see that they are the energy sources of the diet, right? We get calories from the carbs, the proteins, and the fat. Micronutrients, on the other hand, are not energy providing, but they certainly are vital for the proper uh, functioning of the biological system. And we have, within micronutrients, we have vitamins, we have macro minerals, which are large quantity, fairly large quantities of minerals in the body. And we have micro minerals, usually required in microgram amount. And the macro minerals are usually in milligram amount. And we have water considered as a nutrient as well. So this slide illustrates what we actually mean by nutrients. Okay, so this is a concept that needs to be known cold it means that you need to memorize uh, these values so that you can do the appropriate calculations quite efficiently now when we talk about energy coming from carbohydrates we really mean four calories per gram of carbohydrate so one gram of carbohydrate equals four kilocalories one gram of protein equals four kilocalories one gram of fat nine kilocalories and one gram of alcohol, seven kilocalories. So calories only come from the macronutrients and from alcohol. So here are some calculations that we can do with this information. So for example, if I say that a patient's had a slice of bread, you want to derive how many calories are coming from that. Well, the carbohydrates in the slice of bread is 15 grams. The amount of protein in that slice of bread is 3 grams, and the amount of fat is 0.5. So we can say in all that that one slice of bread contains 76.5 calories. How do we determine that? Well, 15 grams of carbohydrate 
means that there are, if we consider four calories for every gram, it means that there are 60 carbohydrate calories in that bread. Since protein has four calories per gram and there are three grams of protein, three grams times four, 12 kilocalories. And since one gram of fat has nine calories and there are 0.5 grams, 0.5 times nine, 4.5. So when we add them all up, 60 plus 12 plus 4.5, we get 76.5 calories. The Institute of Medicine has established acceptable macronutrient range distributions that are consistent with healthy living after much scientific research. Essentially, the ranges that we have here are the ones that we currently support in the United States, and they appear to be consistent uh, if followed to lower incidences of disease. Carbohydrate intake should be between 45 to 65 percent of DRI calories, but here the idea is really a prominence of complex starches and whole grains that should be in the diet. The protein um, should be between 10 to 35 percent of calories. 35 percent is very high. It's much higher than what the WHO recommends. WHO uh, recommends no higher than 15% of DRI calories. But here in the United States, because of extreme sports uh, and the lifestyles that we lead in terms of exercise, strength, uh, strengthening exercises, and so forth, the calorie or the percent of calories for protein appears to go higher. But the most accurate method, especially the one used in healthcare, uh, appears to be more uh, tied with body weight than with percent calories. So we're going to be really talking about uh, the physiological requirement based on body burden of protein. And here, the physiological requirement at baseline is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. These values go a little bit higher, and we'll talk about them later on. Fat levels should be between 20 to 35% of DRI calories. And again, uh, the th higher levels of 35%, uh, much higher than the 1977 guidelines of 30%, uh, is consistent um, with the higher level of exercise and energy expenditure that we see in extreme sports and marathon running. So a dietitian is best equipped uh, to guide an individual in these higher levels of fat, uh, ensuring that the fats in questions are of good quality. I want to discuss now the value and the significance of dietary carbohydrates found in section 2.1.2 uh, in your textbook. In discussing the subject of carbohydrates, we can start off by simply outlining the general organization of carbohydrates. We think of carbohydrates then as simple sugars. We can think of them as starches. Uh, we can think of them also as fiber. And so we're going to look first at what we understand to be starches. Starches are really polysaccharides, or in other words, complex carbohydrates. Starches are important because when we look at the carbohydrate intake in North America, it's estimated that 60% of those carbohydrates are starches, whereas really 30% uh, come from sucrose and about 10%. There are essentially two types of starches, amylose and amylopectin. Foods that are high in amylose tend to be starchy fruits like banana and vegetables like parsnips, maybe beans, legumes including soybeans, kidney beans, navy beans, and lentils. These all tend to be high in amylose. Uh, by contrast, starches that are uh, elevated in amylopectin tend to be potatoes, rice, and wheat. Structurally speaking, amylose is made up of a straight line um, structure of glucose molecules that are essentially linked together by uh, alpha 1,4 glucosidic bonds which are digestible by the amylase enzyme. 
The amylopectin structure tends to be more branched than straight line. So it's a complex molecules of side chains uh, that are linked uh, together by uh, alpha 1, 4, just like the amylose. But in addition, the branches are alpha 1, 6. Um, the enzyme uh, that digests these large molecules produce essentially monosaccharides and disaccharides, which eventually get uh, absorbed by the uh, enterocytes of the GI tract. Because of the extensive branching of the amylopectin, uh, there is a greater and easier access to the digestive enzymes, leading to a faster release of glucose molecules into the enterocyte and therefore into the bloodstream. So the amylopectin foods tend to have a higher uh, glycemic index than we would see with the strictly amylose um, starches, which have a tighter uh, sort of structural um, build, uh, given that the branching is not there. So it's really strictly uh, the... Um, uh, the alpha-1,4 enzymes tightly bound together. So it's more difficult for the enzymes to get in there for the amylose molecule, molecule but again, the branching for the amylopectin uh, allows a, a much easier access of the digestive enzyme, quicker release of glucose. Next, I want to examine fibers and specifically what role they play in our diet. So one way of defining a fiber is an undigestible carbohydrate. We can see here structurally that fibers are, especially in the form of cellulose, a series of glucose molecules linked together, but by a beta-1,4 glucosidic link, which is undigestible, which means basically no gastrointestinal enzymes can hydrolyze these links. We can classify fibers as either soluble fiber or as insoluble fiber. Let's take a closer look at what these definitions mean. So soluble fibers consist mostly of what we call gums, mucilage, pectins, psyllium, found in fruits and legumes and seeds, and also in some vegetables. Soluble fibers are also viscous fibers, which means that they have a tendency to ferment in the GI tract as they mix with the bacteria in the GI tract. The action of these viscous fibers is primarily noticeable at the level of blood cholesterol. So the fibers, because they are binding to water, they also bind bile and consequently have an effect in lowering blood cholesterol. They also have a slow glucose absorption that results from um, these fibers. So the more soluble fibers, the slower the glucose absorption. This tends to be beneficial uh, for diabetes. And of course, the lowering of the cholesterol tends to be beneficial for heart disease. There's also a slow transit of uh, food through the upper GI tract with um, soluble fibers. It holds on to the moisture in the stool because it's water soluble and consequently has an effect of softening the stool. And we'll see later on how that influences um, the GI tract in a very positive way by decreasing the risk of diverticulosis. So soft stool in the GI tract really decreases what we call intraluminal pressure within the GI tract. So the takeaway message from viscous or soluble fibers is that they're soluble and also more fermentable in the GI tract. And this means that they'll produce uh, gases, short-chain fatty acids, for example, that give energy to the GI tract. There's some benefit uh, in terms of uh, influencing the makeup of the microbiota of the GI tract. And also these viscous fibers have a tendency to soften the stool. By contrast, insoluble fibers uh, do not absorb water. They do not form colloidal masses uh, like the soluble fibers. And we find these insoluble fibers in cellulose and lignin, 
uh, in psyllium, and many of the hemicellulose found in whole grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables as well. The insoluble fibers, or what we call the non-viscous fibers, tend to be non-fermentable, and they tend to be associated with that whole grain diet that we talk about is very important for good health. So notably, we see a lot of non-viscous uh, fibers in brown rice, uh, in wheat bran, and whole, grain in whole grains. So when you get a high-fiber cereal, like a, a raisin bran cereal, it's essentially high in bran, or in other words, a non-viscous fiber. Now, this fiber tends to increase the fecal weight and the speed, consequently, of fecal passage through the colon. It does this in two ways, by increasing the, um, um, by increasing the weight, it also becomes susceptible to the gravitational pull, so it's going to move through the GI tract faster. And this uh, insoluble fiber actually has a drying effect of water, which causes a flushing of water through the GI tract. A flushing of water, by the way, that isn't absorbed by this fiber because it's a non-soluble fiber. So um, it also provides um, a certain feeling of fullness as well. So consequently, it alleviates constipation because it uh, reduces um, uh, the time it takes for the fecal material to go through the colon. It lowers the risk of diverticulosis, of hemorrhoids, appendicitis, and it also, because of the feeling of fullness, may help uh, in weight management. So this means that if you're going to increase the fiber in your diet, you should eat first whole grain breakfast cereals that contain at least more than five grams of fiber per serving. You'll get that with a lot of the uh, high fiber cereals like Total Raisin Bran and uh, a lot of the Kellogg's high fiber cereals. Eating raw and cooked vegetables is also an excellent way. Fruits and vegetables with their skin, pears, potatoes, apples. And adding legumes to soups, to salads, and to casseroles are just a fabulous way to increase fiber intake as well as a broad assortment of different nutrients. And of course, eating fresh and dry fruit for, dry fruit for snack is an excellent way of increasing the fiber intake as well. Dietary fiber recommendations vary depending on the different organizations, but in general, we could say that the guidelines vary between 20 to 40 grams of dietary fiber per day. Now, the minimum recommended by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, in addition to the National Cancer Institute, is 20 grams per day. So that's the least that you can have. Alternatively, uh, the Institute of Medicine recommends ca uh, grams per thousand, you know, kilocalories per day. So the recommendation is, uh, is 11.5 to 14 grams per thousand uh, calories. So this is kind of a really important recommendation because it means that uh, the gram intake of, um, gra of fiber will increase as the caloric intake increases. So a 2,000 calorie diet uh, will essentially uh, require that uh, you bring in 28 grams of um, fiber per day, for instance. The range, according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, that is acceptable is 20 to 35 grams. This is what they generally recommend. Uh, for families that have uh, cancer, for instance, the recommendation is 35 to 40. The Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research recommends for women 21 to 25 grams, for men 30 to 38. And in an exceptional way, people with hypercholesterolemia or high levels of blood cholesterol, um, the recommendation is to increase fiber to 50 grams per day with a preponderance of soluble fiber. If you want to read up more about fiber, you can also go to the Mayo Clinic webpage, and here it is right here, and you can uh, write it right into your Internet Explorer or your Google Chrome and explore uh, the different articles and the different recommendations that they have for fiber.
after looking over the Mayo Clinic review, uh, which among the foods below um, contains about 16 grams of fiber in one serving? That's really high. Is it the one cup of raspberries? Is it the one cup of whole wheat spaghetti? The one cup of split um, peas, sunflower seeds? Is it the raisins? The answer is actually um, the split peas that are cooked one cup, a very uh, significant amount of fiber. And this uh, is the message uh, for those that want to increase their fiber intake is to include legumes into the diet. Now I want to pay attention to sugar consumption um, and the role that moderate to large intakes um, play in the development of chronic disease. So how do we control for excessive sugar intake? Well, first we have to identify that sugar comes from first of all, the total sugar in our diet, which is from natural sugar and from added sugar. And the NIH tells us that whenever population groups consume more than 20% of their calories from sugar, from total sugar, the quality of the nutrition goes down. So although there is no government regulation specifically restricting total sugar, we can certainly go by the guideline of aiming for less than 20% of calories. So this means a person consuming 2,500 calories a day, uh, if you multiply that 2,500 calories by 0 0.20, which is 20%, then divide that amount by 4, you get 125 grams. So this would be the maximal amount of total sugar. So this would be the sugar coming from uh, fruits and juices and milk, and it would also include um, the sugar that's coming from your breakfast cereals and the processed foods. So all of these combined together um, would be limited to 125 grams per day on a 2500 calorie diet, but the guideline is less than 20%. The other way to do it is also is to restrict the added sugar, and this the government recommends, to less than 10% of the calories and the added sugar is really the sugar that's been added by the manufacturer so you're looking at a lot of processed foods now i want to review the principles and the concepts of dietary protein so let's begin with defining what a protein is a protein is really an accumulation of amino acids linked together to form a protein and where do we find proteins but in muscles and in organs? And the main sources of the um, uh, protein in our diet are the meats, the fish, the poultry, the dairy products. And then we also have the beans and nuts, or the beans are also called legumes, and they include uh, things like soybean, fava bean, romano bean, soybeans, a variety of lentils, and so forth, and the nuts. And these provide us with our basic um, uh, proteins in our diet. Section 2.1.3 gives you more of the structural um, frame of a protein and of an amino acid, and it provides you with additional information regarding uh, the um, indispensable uh, amino acids or the necessary required amino acids uh, as well as the conditionally indispensable and so forth. So I encourage you to read through the chapter and to get more uh, complete information regarding the proteins. Here's a summary of the basic requirements that you need to know about protein. First in terms of uh, percent of calories um, the uh, macronutrient recommended guidelines is 10 to 35 percent of the DRI calories or the requirement calories. Now in terms of specific guidelines they are based on uh, body weight and we will be relying on this especially when we get into the medical aspect of, of, of the protein needs but we know that physiologically uh, the, um, the protein requirements for the body is a 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. So this basically means that if an individual um, weighs, let's say, 80 kilograms, that his amount or her, her amount of protein based on the body weight would be 64 grams or 0.8 times 80 kilograms. Uh, 
Now, this is a basic physiological requirement. It usually is associated with roughly 10% of the DRI calories. But when it comes to the need for higher activity, um, the guidelines suggest anywhere between 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram uh, body weight will meet the needs of most individuals that are actually working out. And this usually is associated with roughly about uh, anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of the DRI calories. The maximal allowance for protein is estimated at 2 grams per kilogram body weight. And that's for all uh, healthy individuals, right, that even do uh, even those that do a lot of sport, a lot of strengthening exercises, uh, they shouldn't really be going over 2 grams per kilogram body weight. So when we calculate the protein needs or how much protein we have in our diet, we can assume that there are 4 calories of energy for every gram of protein. Uh, and the other thing to consider is that protein is our primary source of nitrogen. And this is one of the reasons why our requirements are usually based on body weight, i.e. 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight, because when we eat protein, we have to consider um, the burden on the body because we need to process that protein through our kidney and we essentially then pee it out as urea nitrogen. So protein is very different than carbohydrate uh, or fat in that way. Essential amino acids are referred to in the textbook as indispensable amino acids. They're found on table 2.1. And indispensable amino acids means that the body absolutely requires them through the diet in order to be able to synthesize protein properly. There are, in fact, nine essential amino acids or indispensable amino acids that are needed in order to synthesize protein. And these are leucine, isoleucine, valine, threonine, lysine, histidine, methionine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. And they're all found here. Now, one of the things that nutritionists and dietitians should do is be able to memorize these. And I've created a sentence below to help in the memorization process. Lucy and Lucy and Valerie and all three lied about having met for a phenomenal historical trip. Now this wacky sentence is actually easy to remember and you'll see in the next slide how the names of the individuals and of the different events in this sentence are actually the beginnings of the different amino acids. Indeed, I've highlighted in red the beginning of each of the amino acids and the different events that are described. So LEU for leucine, isoleucine, val for valine, 3 for threonine, lide for lysine, met for methionine, PHE for phenomenal, historical, right, Phen uh, PHE for phenylalanine, hist for his histidine, and trip for tryptophan. So I expect students to memorize this sentence and to be able then to memorize the nine essential amino acids. Now I'd like to talk about dietary fats, both in terms of the recommended quantity of fat based on macronutrient ranges that have been deemed reasonable and healthy for the American population, and also in terms of the quality of the fat that needs to be consumed. This can be further complemented by reading section 2.1.4 on lipids in your textbook. When we talk about fats, it's really a broad category that includes lipids, and they consist of cholesterol, saturated fat, unsaturated fat, and phospholipids. Um, for the most part, our understanding is that foods that are high in dietary cholesterol and saturated fats can increase the risk of heart disease. So we tend to cautiously try to restrict or diminish the contents of saturated fat specifically because it's the greatest and most significant culprit, whereas dietary cholesterol is not really considered as nefariously as it once did. Uh, but still, for some familial types of hypercholesterolemia, we talk to the patients about lowering their dietary cholesterol. Now, foods that are high in unsaturated fat, such as vegetable oils and olive oil, can lower the risk of heart disease. 
Here are a few things to remember about fats and oils. First of all, they're composed of lipids. Uh, these are molecules that are essentially insoluble in water. They contain nine calories for every gram. The contrast, obviously, the protein at four calories per gram and the carbs at four calories per gram. They're found in butter. They're found in margarine and vegetable oils. And essentially, there's a source of fat-soluble vitamins and essential fatty acids. And these essential fatty acids means that they are essential to life, to the maintenance uh, and the growth of the neurological system. There are a lot of details on this slide, but essentially they go over the um, content and comparisons between oils in terms of um, content of polyunsaturated oils, which we refer to here as linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is the first of the essential fatty acids, and we can see it primarily very present in um, sunflower seed oil, um, safflower seed oil, corn oil, soybean oil, um, cotton seed oil. So very present in these. And these, this linoleic acid is what we call a polyunsaturated fat. And uh, the description of polyunsaturated fat is in the section of your textbook, um, which is section 2.1.4 that, revi that reviews the lipids and the structure of saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated. And so I'd like you to review those. But for now, what I'm going to do is uh, just look at the various components here. And one um, uh, additional essential fatty acid uh, is in gray. And it's not prominently found. This is the alpha um, linolenic acid as opposed to linoleic. This one is called alpha linolenic acid. Let's take a look where it's found primarily. So it's significant in canola oil. Uh, it's very prominent in flaxseed oil. And then it's um, prominent as well in soybean oil. So these are the three main oils that contain the alpha linolenic acid. So there are two essential amino acids, uh, essential fatty acids rather, linoleic acid, which is a polyunsaturated fat, and then um, alpha linolenic acid, which is also um, a polyunsaturated fat, but of a different structure. It's an omega-3 fatty acid. The linolenic acid, made up of polyunsaturated fats, is an omega-6 fatty acid. And then in black, we have the monounsaturated fats, which are very common uh, in olive oil. So you can see here that olive oil is the oil that has the most prevalent amount of monounsaturated fat. Um, in second, we have the canola oil. And in third, uh, we have the peanut oil. And so these are the three main vegetable sources of um, monounsaturated fat. Uh, we find also, very interestingly, in butter fat, uh, you know, a significant amount there of monounsaturated fat. And we also find it in beef tallow and in lard. And this is a very noticeable and significant uh, content here, which we're going to discuss a little later on. But for now, it's important that the students understand the differences of the different oils. First, um, first there are the polyunsaturated oils rich in linoleic acid, which are omega-6s. Then there are the oils that are polyunsaturated as well, that are alpha-linolenic acid in gray, and these are of the omega-3 fatty acids. Then there are the ones in black, which are the monounsaturated fats, considered very healthy, and these are of the omega-9 fatty acids. And then at the top here, uh, we see the saturated fats, and the saturated fats are um, indicated in the darker gray on the far left side. And what's notable here is, as a rule, we tend to uh, vilify the meats and the lards as being prominent sources of uh, saturated fat. And this high saturated fat is linked to higher risks of heart disease. It's even more atherogenic than dietary cholesterol. But what we often miss is the palm oil, the butter fat, uh, not the butter fat, sorry, the palm oil and the coconut oil, which are vegetable oils that are uh, significantly uh, high in saturated fat. And it's not quite clear in the literature yet uh, whether or not the saturated fat 
uh, in these oils are um, as atherogenic or prone to, to increasing the risk of heart disease as in beef tallow and lard. Uh, certainly we see butter fat is high as well and that's always been vilified. In fact, that's why we turned um, to margarines only to discover later on uh, that the margarines were more nefarious than the butter fat and more nefarious than the lard. The same thing for the shortenings, right? The shortenings ended up being more nefarious than the lard. And why is that? Well, that's because the, the margarines and the shortenings were extremely high in trans fatty acids, uh, which were created as a byproduct um, when uh, the food industry was creating these um, artificial fats, so to speak, or artificial um, uh, butter-like or lard-like fats. Now, if you look at the composition, you'll see that the lard actually wasn't as bad as you know so many thought. Yes, it was high in saturated fat, but there was actually a significant amount of monounsaturated fat. So taken in moderation, this was not actually a bad choice. The same thing for butter. You can see, sure, it is high in saturated fat, but there's also a significant amount of monounsaturated fat. So taking, taking both the lard and the butter fat you know, in moderation, by not over-consuming baked products, for example, which is where they tend to be used, uh, it can be part of a very healthy diet. Whereas now the margarines uh, and the shortenings are looked at more nefariously. Uh, I encourage students to refer to Focus Box 2.1 in your textbook in the second column, Percent Dietary Standards, to memorize these standards. Um, now what we're specifically looking at is the cutoff for saturated fat, less than 10% of calories, polyunsaturated fat, 5 to 10%. And the reason is that while the polyunsaturated fats are providing that essential fatty acid, uh, uh, alpha, you know, um, basically linoleic acid, and uh, while the polyunsaturated fats of the, which is an, of course an omega-6, and while the uh, polyunsaturated fats of the omega-3 category um, are providing uh, alpha linolenic acid. These are very important. The polyunsaturated oils are uh, essentially limited to about 10% because there is some concern that high levels of uh, polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acids have a tendency to become pro-oxidants. In other words, bringing higher levels of oxidative stress and micro-inflammation to the body. Many cardiovascular researchers are suspecting that the high level of polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acids in our diet are responsible for this micro-inflammation, which is actually part of the etiology of heart disease. So containing it to 5 to 10 percent is uh, really meant to meet the essentiality of these fatty acids, but not to uh, bring in so much of this um, omega-6 fatty acid that it becomes a pro-oxidant in our body. Now, the the reverse, of course, uh, for the um, omega-3s is very clear. The omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, so oils that are high in omega-3s, notably uh, the flaxseed, uh, notably the canola oil and the soybean, are really to be encouraged, in addition, of course, to the oils uh, that come from certain types of fish high in omega-3s. These are protective against heart disease. Now, the other component uh, that we should look at is also, you know, the amount um, or the cutoffs for monounsaturated fat. And most agree that the literature suggests that um, a good healthy diet should not contain uh, less than 11% of the calories coming from monounsaturated fat. This is in your textbook, and I ask you to review these. Uh, on page 52, the Focus Box 2.1, and of course it continues to explore this on page uh, 54. So the macronutrient range recommendations for carbohydrate, protein, and fat, in addition to the specific cutoff and ranges for the specific fats, saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated fats, these are all 
uh, coming from very two distinct uh, recommendations, the USDA My Plate Guide, and of course the healthy vegetarian and Mediterranean diets are all supportive of this type of eating. Uh, moreover, we can see that the cutoff recommendations that we have for the fats are also very consistent with the DASH diet, which we're going to see uh, in greater depth in the cardiovascular heart disease chapter. DASH diet is dietary approach to stop hypertension. The 2015 Dietary Guideline for Americans had key principles for long-term health. We're just going to review them here. They should be um, part of what you understand is important in nutrition guidance. So first, maintenance and achieving a healthy weight by you know making wise selections in food and beverage choices that are high in nutrient density uh, in order to diminish the risk of chronic diseases. So this is actually a very important focus. Limit the intake, uh, uh, the caloric intake and ingest nutrient dense foods that are consistent with my plate. So a lot of fruits and vegetables and so forth. Significantly reduce the intake of foods that are high in sugar, saturated fats, sodium, and make healthy beverage choices. In other words, uh, really stay away from processed foods that tend to be high in the saturated fat, the sodium, and the sugar, and stay away from soda pop. Shift food and beverage choices away, really from the less healthy ones towards really healthy choices, which really is a very soft way of saying embrace diets that we know are very healthy, the Mediterranean diet, um, also the, um, the Oriental diet, for instance, uh, promote healthy eating in schools, in the workplace, in community centers, in churches. So be part of that, uh, that community that encourages an extension of healthy eating habits in the home, bring them into the community, and really teach the children early on to stay away from the fast food and the junk food. So a lecture on healthy eating wouldn't be complete unless we dedicate some time to understanding dietary reference intakes, or what we refer to as the DRIs. Let's begin now with the understanding of what exactly is a dietary reference intake, a DRI. Well, a DRI really uh, encompasses the dietary reference intakes for nutrients, uh, and also uh, for energy, and for the macronutrients that we talk about, the um, recommended macronutrient ranges, right, or the acceptable macronutrient range distribution. So this encompasses all of the DRIs. Now, when we look specifically, we can see that within the DRIs for uh, nutrients, we have the estimated average requirements, the EAR. We have the recommended dietary allowance, RDA. Um, we have adequate intakes, the AI, and we have the tolerable uh, upper intake levels, the UL. Now let's take a look at each of these so we have a better understanding. So I've outlined here the four DRIs for nutrients that I just spoke about. The estimated average requirement, EAR, recommended dietary allowance, RDA, adequate intake, AI, tolerable upper intake level UL. So we're going to take a look at all of these. It's important for students to acquire a certain mastery of understanding of what these various DRIs mean and how they can be used. Before beginning, I'd like students to read over section 2.2 in the textbook that actually goes over in a summary form, but with enough detail to make it comprehensive, uh, the different DRIs that I'm referring to here. So the first thing to remember is that the um, estimated average requirement represents the nutrient requirement needs of 50% of the population. This is determined scientifically uh, by some rigorous science that measures quantitative limits and cutoffs. And then the recommended dietary allowance is determined by simply adding two standard deviations onto the EAR. This is uh, nicely represented in figure 2.6 in your textbook. And it's specifically the recommended dietary allowances that are used in the assessment of individual needs when we do um, diet counseling or we're reviewing dietary intakes from 24-hour recalls or food records. 
suffice to say that the RDAs uh, are sufficiently well developed that they represent uh, 97 to 98 percent of the nutrient requirement needs of a healthy population, uh, in particular lifestyles and gender groups. Adequate intakes are less rigorously determined by referring back to figure 2.6. You can see how there is variability in an AI. It's not as well determined scientifically as the EAR from which is derived the RDA, but you can see that the AI uh, is somewhere around the RDA, uh, and it's a way of approximating the requirements um, of a, an individual or a population, if you will, um, uh, just uh, based on observations and, and less um, confirmatory uh, research than the RDA, but it approximates uh, adequately uh, the RDA with a great deal of variability. Read more about the AI in the textbook, page 55 in the second edition. The UL, or the Tolerable Upper Intake Level, was established um, in the wake of a lot of supplementation and a lot of functional foods that have a lot of supplementation in them. And so consequently, the risk of excessive intake uh, had been noted, and there was consequently an establishment of these upper tolerable limits, uh, where if um, an individual exceeds uh, that limit, the risk of uh, toxicity increases um, exponentially the more they exceed that upper limit. These uh, ULs are found right here and they're also found at the end of chapter 3 in your textbook. And you can see that um, a toxicity then occurs when an individual's intake increases beyond these particular cutoffs. So it can be a little misleading because an individual might be taking in 500% of their RDA, meaning that they're you know, exceeding their RDA by 500%. But if the quantity actually consumed uh, of that specific nutrient doesn't exceed this particular cutoff, then the intake of that individual remains adequate. So it's very important to understand that, that these particular cutoffs here are meant to understand that if you exceed these cutoffs, uh, you're increasing your risk of toxicity. But if you re remain below these cutoffs, then the risk of toxicity uh, is significantly um, less. Uh, and this ha is really independently determined uh, from the percent RDA. Right? The percent RDA can be very misleading because these percentages can be very high and it simply means that you're exceeding the RDA specifically, but it's not exceeding the RDA that creates toxicity, it's exceeding the UL cutoff. So good thing to remember. So what can we conclude from this? Well, that it is actually safe to eat nutrients between the RDA all the way up to the UL. The risk of toxicity is absolutely minimal. The moment that we cross the UL, we increase our risk of toxicity, and that risk increases exponentially the more we exceed the UL. Now I want to take a few moments and introduce you to the principles behind assessing a human diet. So I want to go over the principles here of what constitutes a risk of deficient nutrients. First of all, the macronutrients. When are they suboptimal? Well, consider the healthy macronutrient ranges. Carbohydrates have a healthy macronutrient range of 45 to 65% of DRI calories. And I'd like to stress DRI calories because uh, these particular standards are not established based on what someone eats, but really based on what their requirements are. Protein 10 to 35 and fat 20 to 35. So 
A suboptimal intake of carbohydrates is when you're less than 45. For protein, it's when you're less than 10. And fat is when you're less than 20% of the DRI calories. Now let's take a look at the micronutrients. The probability approach developed by George Beaton from the University of Toronto explains that when the micronutrient intake of an individual is less than 66% of the RDA, it increases the risk of micronutrient deficiency. So when we talk about excesses and we come back to macronutrients, well, excesses would be when um, you're over 65% of energy coming from carbohydrates. So you'd be excessive in carbohydrate. You'd be excessive in protein intake if you're over 35% of the DRI calories. And you'd be excessive in fat intake if you were over 35% of the DRI calories. For micronutrients, excess, again, is only when you exceed the UL, as indicated on the UL table previously, also found at the end of chapter three. This table illustrates how a nutrient analysis can effectively be, be made. The first column indicates the nutrients. The second one is the RDA. The third one is the actual intake. And the th uh, fourth column is the percent of the RDA. So what we have here is the RDA for calcium is 1,000 milligrams, thiamine 1.1 milligrams, vitamin A 900 micrograms, and vitamin D 15 micrograms. So what we see in this dietary intake is that the individual is consuming 650 milligrams of, um, in their diet, and this represents 65% of the RDA, that's 650 divided by 1,000 milligrams times 100. So the same calculations are done for the other nutrients. So thiamine uh, represents 62% uh, of the RDA, vitamin A 76%, and vitamin D 287%. So let's take a look at these percentages. So based on our understanding for micronutrients, the intake at 65% for calcium is deficient because it's under uh, or at a high risk of being deficient, I should say, in the diet because it's less than 66%. The thiamine at 62% is also at high risk of being deficient in the diet at less than 66%. But the vitamin A at 76%, even though it's under the RDA, the probability model indicates that at 76%, there's a much lower risk of it being deficient. So we talk about being um, adequate. Um, this adequacy, again, is anything over 66 all the way up to the UL. The vitamin D at 43 micrograms represents 287% of the RDA, and that would lead us to maybe think that this is actually um, an excessive amount. Uh, but if you consult um, the UL table at the end of chapter 3, you'll see that uh, 43 milligram or micrograms is still under the 50 microgram uh, cutoff for the UL. So even though it's 287%, it's still adequate because uh, that intake of 43 micrograms is still under the cutoff uh, for uh, the UL for that particular nutrient. Here's an example of how a diet can be assessed in terms of calories and micronutrients. At the top, we have the caloric intake, 2,060 calories, and we have the DRI calories, that is, the calories that this person requires based on their height and their weight and their age, uh, and that is uh, needed for weight stability, 2,750 calories. So what we want to do here is we want to determine if the calories are low enough so that they might indicate um, a possibility of deficient calories in the diet. And to do that, a caloric intake that's less than 75% of the DRIs can be considered at risk of being deficient. So let's see what percent that we're at. 2060 over 2750, 74.9%. This is indeed less than 75%. So we can put D here as deficient. Now, when it comes to the micronutrients, uh, we use a different uh, kind of assessment. Um, approach. If the uh, micronutrient is less than or equal to 66% of the RDA or the DRI, uh, it's considered deficient. So let's take a look at the vitamin D. 3.4 micrograms and the DRI 
is uh, 15 micrograms. Well, let's check the percent, 3.4 divided by 15 times 100, 22.67. 22.67% is indeed less than 66% of the DRI. This means that this individual runs a high risk that their dietary intake might be chronically deficient. So we put a D. Let's take a look at vitamin E. 11 milligrams is the intake. The DRI is 15. 11 over 15 times 100, 73.33%. Now one might be prompted to say, well, the percent is indeed less than 100%, which means it's clearly under the RDA, so shouldn't it be deficient? Well, we're using the uh, probability model of uh, Dr. Beaton out of the University of Toronto that indicates that uh, given the variability in intake, some days we get high intakes, other days we get low intakes, and statistically what appears to be significant is when that low intake as an average is less or equal to 66% of that DRI, it's at a high risk of deficiency. So at 73%, um, we could essentially say that the intake is adequate. Thiamine, 3.4 to 1.2. Here, we're consuming 283.33% of, of the RDA. We would be prompted to say, well, this person's intake might be excessive. But remember, the only way to determine the excessive nature of a nutrient is to look at the ULs, which were found on the slide previously and at the end of Chapter 3 of your textbook. And you can see that when you look at the list of DR of uh, ULs, of upper tolerable limits, uh, thiamine is nowhere to be found. Any nutrient that isn't found in that list simply means that no one has ever been able to determine a toxicity level. So this means that regardless of the percentage and regardless of the intake, 3.4, uh, this um, thiamine intake can only be um, essentially uh, categorized as insufficient or deficient if it's under 66% of the DRI, or it could only be uh, assessed as adequate, but certainly it can't be assessed as excessive. Vitamin C, 1300 milligrams, 90 milligrams. Well, now we've got another example. So here, the percent uh, looks outrageously high, 1,444% of the DRI one would be prompted to say, oh, this has got to be excessive. But again, going back to the UL table, you'll see that the UL for vitamin C uh, is, n is not uh, 1,300. In fact, 1,300 is well below. So this means that this nutrient can also, in this case, be categorized as adequate. Now, I want to add one more thing in regard to excesses in terms of calories. We were able to see for a deficiency that if it's less than 75% of the DRI, then it would be called deficient. Uh, but for calories to be excessive, it's got to be greater than 25% over the DRI. To make it easy, let's uh, do one calculation, for example, just to set the record straight. So if the DRI is 2,750, we simply multiply uh, that amount by 1.25, and that tells us that the upper cut off for what is excessive is 3,400 and 38 calories. So if somebody's intake is greater than 3,000, or if this person's intake, I should say, is greater than 3,438, then we could say that their intake uh, is at a high risk of being considered excessive. Another aspect of a nutrient analysis that you must know is also the macronutrients. Again, we've spoken about this earlier, but here's a reminder. What is it that you need to know cold are the um, recommended macronutrient ranges for carb, protein, and fat. These you must know absolutely without hesitation. In addition, you need to know the polyunsaturated ranges of 5 to 10% of DRI calories. Uh, again, the carbohydrates, it's 45 to 65% of the DRI calories, same for the protein and the fat. Notice that I say DRI calories and not actual calories. Indeed, when, a per when you're measuring a person's uh, standards by which you're going to compare their carbohydrate intake, you don't use what they eat, you use what they should eat. And this establishes the standard. Then you can measure what they eat and say whether or not 
uh, the carbohydrates that are consumed in their diet is within this standard. But the standard that we're talking about in grams is derived from these percentages here using the DRI calories or the recommended calories. Same thing for the polyunsaturated fats. To meet the healthy standards, the polyunsaturated fats should be 5 to 10% of the DRI calories. The monounsaturated fats uh, equal to 11 uh, or greater, right, all the way up to 20% of the DRI calories. Saturated fat less than 10% of the DRI calories and total sugar less than 20% of the DRI calories. So now for an example, uh, let's uh, look at what we would do if a person's uh, DRI calories were 2,350 calories. So the goal then would be to change these um, healthy eating standards in column 2 into gram equivalencies because essentially it would be easier then to compare the actual intakes because the actual intakes when recorded by computer analysis will also be in grams. So it's best if you take your calculators out and follow along with the calculations. So I'll do the first one with you. Carbohydrates, 45 to 65 percent. And so what are we looking at is 45 percent of 2,350 and 65 percent of 2,350. In that manner, we can set up the gram range of carbohydrates for healthy eating. So now if we do the multiplication, 2,350 multiplied by the lower range of 0.45 or 45%. This gives us uh, 1,058 calories. We divide that by 4, again, because there are 4 calories for every gram of carbohydrate. And the lower range should give us 264 grams. Let's do the upper range, 0.65, because that's 65%, times 2,350. That gives us 1,528 calories. Divide that by 4, because there's 4 calories per gram. And we get an upper limit of 382 grams. You can do the same thing with protein. And you can do the same thing with fat, remembering to uh, divide by 9. And you can do the same thing with the polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and saturated fats, uh, remembering that these are all fats. So when you're doing the division, um, uh, it's important to divide by 9. Now, when we do sugar, sugar, of course, is a carbohydrate. So sugar has 4 calories for every gram. So this means the calculation goes as follows. Uh, 0 0.2, which is 20%, times 2,350, and divide that by 4, and we get 117.5 grams, which could be rounded up to 118 grams. So it's less than 118 grams uh, per day in total sugar, uh, which is the goal for healthy eating. Now we can actually um, input the actual computer analysis of the diet and we can see that in column 3. Uh, 282 grams of carb, 130 grams of protein, 64 grams of fat and so forth all the way down. And on the fourth column we're going to assess whether it's adequate, uh, suboptimal or excessive. So A for adequate, S for sub suboptimal, E for excessive. So if we look at the carbohydrates, we can see it's very easy because now we've got our standards in the second column in grams and we have our computer analysis generating our intake, our actual intake in grams. So if we look at it, we can see that at 282, we're clearly between 264 and 382, so we get an A for adequate for carbohydrates. Protein, 59 to 206 grams, and at 130 grams, clearly in between the range, so it's adequate. The fat at 52 to 91, uh, at 64 grams, that is also within the range. Consider that as adequate. What about the polyunsaturated fats? Well, 5 to 10 percent of the calories uh, amounted to 13 to 26, but we're only, that person is only consuming 9 grams, not within the range. Actually, it's under the lower end, which is the 5 percent, which is 13 grams. So because of that, this person's intake is suboptimal. What about the monounsaturated fat? It's 11 percent 
or greater all the way up to 20%, that's 29 to 52 grams. So at 20 gram intake, we're, that person's intake is clearly below the 29. Again, uh, monounsaturated intakes are suboptimal. Saturated fat is less than 26 grams, which is less than 10% of the DRI calories, if you remember. This person's intake is 35 grams, clearly over that cutoff. Consequently, we can say uh, that this person's intake is excessive. What about total sugar? Cutoff is less than 118 grams. Persons consuming 126 intake is clearly excessive. Now, there's another way of looking at um, the, uh, I would say, the cardiovascular risk. Uh, it's called the PS ratio, or more appropriately, the P and MS ratio. That is the polyunsaturate monounsaturate divided by saturate ratio. So if we do this, we can get an idea of the relative proportion of the good fats, polyunsaturate and monounsaturate, relative to the bad fat, um, which is the saturated fat, which increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. The goal really is to bring this ratio greater than one, uh, and that means that there'd be a greater proportion of polyunsaturates and monounsaturates relative to saturated. So let's take a look. So if we do this, it's 9 grams plus 20 grams divided by the saturate 35 grams. And so we have a ratio of 0.83, which indicates that this is actually a poor ratio. It's under 1. It is likely to mean that the risk of cardiovascular vascular disease is higher. The ideal is greater than 1. So we do have these, uh, this ratio to give us some understanding um, to uh, you know, the proportionality and the quality of fat and what they represent with respect to the risk of cardiovascular disease. So having established the significance of the PMS ratio, I'd like to add some, some perspective to it. Is it possible, do you think, that a person could still end up with an ideal ratio but still be at risk of cardiovascular disease? So the answer is yes. Let's take, for example, the following calculation. Let's stay with our 9 grams of poly and the 20 grams of monounsaturated fat. So we end up with 29. And, um, and now let's take a look at our saturated fat. And if our saturated fat uh, is, for instance, at uh, 27, uh, let's look at the ratio. 29 divided by 27 gives us 1.07. That indicates that we are proportionally, it would seem, at better or higher, you know, at, at good risk or low risk of cardiovascular disease. But when we actually look at the amount of saturated fat at uh, 27, uh, we are clearly above the saturated fat cutoff. So even though the ratio indicates a positive one uh, greater than one risk, or greater than one ratio indicating low risk, uh, the fact that the absolute values of saturated fat are greater than the cutoff uh, supersedes what the uh, ratio reveals to us and uh, helps us to confirm with the patient that they are still dietarily uh, consuming too much saturated fat. All right, so here's a recap. What's the PS ratio? It's the measurement of the proportion of good and healthy fats relative to the proportion of unhealthy fats. Which are the good fats? Monounsaturated fats tied to olive oil, oleic acid, and the Mediterranean diet. The polyunsaturated fats, the omega-6s, uh, in addition to those that are called the omega-3s. These are all polyunsaturated fats. Unhealthy fats, saturated fats, and the trans fatty acids. So what is the ratio? It's the grams of monounsaturated fat plus the grams of polyunsaturated fat divided by the grams of saturated fat. All right now, how about a visual example? Let's say we have polyunsaturated fats of 13 grams monounsaturated fats of 32 and saturated fat of 24. So the PMS 
uh, ratio would be the addition of the good fats divided by the bad fats. The goal is to achieve a ratio higher than one in order to have uh, a diet essentially that uh, indicates a low risk of heart disease. So this would mean adding the poly to the mono, that would be 13 plus 32, and divide that by 24, we'd get a ratio here of uh, 45 over 24, or 1.87. This ratio is clearly over 1 and would be indicative of a low risk of heart disease. Remember, however, that your analysis of these particular fats are not complete until after the ratio you've also compared the absolute values 13 33 or 32 and 24 to the cutoff values in other words comparing the 13 grams to the gram equivalent that you get out of 5 to 10 percent of the calories the 32 that you compare to the 11 or greater right up to 20 percent of the calories and the 24 grams compared to the less than 10 percent of the DRI calories and if um, the saturated fat in particular is over um, the cutoff of um, uh, that is indicated for 10 percent uh, then it doesn't really matter what the ratio is saying uh, especially if it indicates a positive greater than one. Because it, the saturated fat is over the cutoff, you still have to conclude that the patient is at risk um, dietarily of a, a diet uh, high in risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, while it is clear that we discourage low intakes of nutrients, because we often call these situations suboptimal when it comes to key important and significant nutrients, we have to point out that there are nutrients for which the idea of being low is actually good. Dietary cholesterol, for example, uh, less than 300 milligrams is really a good thing. Uh, the goal here is not to reach 300 milligrams per day, it's to be under 300 milligrams per day. The same thing for saturated fat. The goal is to be under 10%, not to reach 10%. Trans fatty acids, uh, the byproduct of hydrogenation, the products that we see in margins and shortenings, the goal here is less than 1% of the DRI calories. Uh, sodium, 20, less than 2,400 milligrams per day based on the FDA guidelines. Uh, and here again, the goal is not to reach 2,400 milligrams, but really to stay under it. Same thing for sugar. We're not trying to reach 20% of our calories in sugar. We're staying, we're trying to stay as low as we can under the total sugar cutoff. Uh, added sugar, the government tells us, should be less than 10% of the DRI calories. And again, the added sugar is clearly uh, the sugar that is found in manufactured goods. When we talk about total sugar, just as a matter of a recall here, total sugar includes all the natural sugars found in fruits and vegetables in milk, uh, in addition to the added sugar that's found in processing. Whereas added sugar is strictly tied to or associated with uh, the sugar that has been added by the manufactured uh, who produces the food. So this is an exercise assessing a person's sugar intake. So if a man who requires 3,450 calories a day, remember these are the DRI calories, and if he consumes a total sugar intake of 175 grams, the question is, well, can you determine whether or not he's consuming excessive or adequate amount of sugar? Very quickly, the 20% cutoff is what you've got to remember, so 0.20 times 3450. Divide that by 4, and you get 173 grams per day as the cutoff. He's consuming 175, so the patient is clearly exceeding his cutoff, so his intake is unhealthy, or in other words, excessive. Part of assessing a person's nutrient intake uh, also involves understanding the nutrient density of that person. In other words, the milligrams of nutrients per individual calorie. So for instance, if uh, your patient's consuming 300 milligrams of calcium in one cup of milk, which contains 125 calories, what is the nutrient density? Well, it's 300 milligrams, the quantity of calcium found in the number of calories in that one cup, 125. That gives us a nutrient density of 2.4 milligrams per calorie. 
While we tend to encourage individuals to consume foods high in nutrient density, we discourage them from consuming foods that are high in caloric density. So caloric density really is the number of calories per gram of food. So we're comparing two products here, the donut uh, and the apple, donut highly processed and the apple uh, not processed at all. So the donut weighs 42 grams and contains 195 calories. The caloric density is the number of calories per weight of the donut, so 195 divided by 42, and we get 4.64 calories per gram. Let's compare that to the apple. 182 grams, 95 calories. If we do the caloric density, 95 calories divided by 182, we get 0.52 cals or calories per gram. We can clearly see that the unprocessed fruit contains significantly less calories per weight. And this is really typically seen in all vegetables and fruits uh, and is a lesson for us right when we want to understand you know where are the calories coming from well they're coming from the processed foods that have virtually significant amounts of calories uh, per individual weight in this section we're going to take a look at how to understand food labels how to interpret them properly so as to better make wise and wholesome food selections Recently, there's been a change in the way the Nutrition Facts panel appears. On the left, we have the older version, and on the right, we have the newer version. Two very noticeable changes have taken place. First, the serving size is in bold and much bigger, and the number of calories per serving is certainly a lot bigger as well. And while the new Nutrition Facts panel is still based on a 2,000 calorie diet, we see that some of the daily values have actually changed. Let's take a closer look. The first notable change is the daily value for fat. Historically, the older one was 65 grams, but this newer one is really based on the upper uh, percent range for fat, which is 35%, and that turns out to be about 78 grams grams. So when we take the um, uh, 8 grams of fat that we see in the new panel and we divide it by 78, we get in fact 10%. The daily value for fiber used to be 25 grams and now it's 28 grams. And finally the daily value for carbohydrates uh, used to be 60% of the um, DRI calories is pretty much at 57% of the daily, you know, of the daily calorie requirement, which brings it to roughly 285 grams instead of 300 grams. One thing that's new is that the new uh, Nutrition Facts panel has added sugar, and we know that the government's cutoff for uh, added sugar is 10% of the DRI calories. This is a reminder as well that total sugar doesn't have any government uh, cutoff that's imposed, but in the context of this class, because of um, support of NIH data, uh, we are going to use uh, less than 20% of the DRI calories as our cutoff for total sugar. Now, finally, how to interpret the Nutrition Facts Panel? What do the actual values, numeric values, mean? Well, first, when we're looking at the micronutrients uh, like um, uh, you know, iron or vitamin D or anything like that, uh, you can say that it's an excellent source, that the food's an excellent source for that specific nutrient if the quantity is 20% or higher than the DV. It's a good source if it's 10 to 19.99 of the DV. It's not a good source um, if it's, uh, you know, basically 5 to 9.9, .9, and it's a poor source if less than 5% of the daily value. Now, there are nutrients for which it's actually a good idea to be low. That would be for total fat. We don't want to have it so that it's a poor source, but we don't want it to be a high source either. Saturated fat is a bad fat. We want it low. Trans fats, we want it low. Sodium, we want it low. Total sugar and added sugar, we also want those beneath or below the cutoffs. So then when we're looking at these uh, particular uh, nutrients that aren't so good for us, there are several ways we can categorize them, either high, moderately high, modestly high, or in other words healthy, and or low. 
So high would be any of these uh, rather uh, not so good nutrients being greater or equal to 20% of the DV. Uh, moderately high would be 10 to 19%. Modestly high, or what we could also call healthy, would be contained within 5 to 9% of the DV. And of course, uh, it would be considered low uh, if it was less than 5%. All right, so in summary, this is what we see on the new Nutrition Facts panel. First of all, the serving size is a much larger print, so is the calories per serving. And we know that the daily values have actually changed for some of them. Here are the highlights. So carbohydrates went from 300 grams to 285. Total fat went from 65 to 78 grams. And fiber went from 25 grams all the way up to 28 grams. The FDA has established new rules to guide manufacturers in their labeling of food, specifically whether or not a food could be labeled as healthy. So here are the new guidelines for foods to be labeled as healthy. They must not be low in total fat, but have a fat profile, makeup, that is visible on the label, that predominantly shows the monounsaturated fats and the polyunsaturated fats, and the combined addition or summation of these two fats must be more than the amount of saturated fat. So in other words, the PS ratio must be greater than one. Second, or they can contain at least 10% of the daily value per reference amount customarily consumed of potassium or vitamin D. So that makes them good sources of vitamin D or potassium. So next I'm going to review some key calculations. It's important to know these cold. That basically means that you're able to do them without hesitation and with great fluidity. Uh, minimizing, of course, any errors that you would do uh, because you've practiced them repeatedly. So I encourage you to practice these calculations so that you become very proficient at executing them. So before beginning, I'd like to remind you of the importance of um, being able to transform your uh, given information regarding height and weight uh, into the metric system because a lot of these formulas use the metric system, not the imperial system. So it's important to know these cold. But I will highlight in this list the ones that you absolutely need to know. First, you need to know that one pound is equal to 454 grams. Memorize this. Memorize as well that one pound is also equal to 0 0.454 kilograms. That one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds and that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters or that one inch is equal to 0 0.0254 meters. So it's important that you have this memorized so that you can then execute these um, equations uh, with greater fluidity and ease. So here's one example where the metric conversion is very important. So you have a man or patient, a client at 189 pounds, and you're about to plug his weight into the formula for establishing his resting energy expenditure. But that formula requires the weight in kilograms. So what do you do? You convert the weight in pounds right into kilos. How do you do that? Well, one pound, if you remember, is 454 grams, or to make the conversion faster, 0 0.454 kilograms. Consequently, 189 pounds would be equal to 189 times 0 0.454 kilograms, or 85.81 kilograms. It's very important to keep two units after the decimal point. Do not round up body weights. You will also need to convert that patient's height 
into centimeters or meters depending on the equation. So if a man is 5 feet 10 inches tall, then you need to convert um, 5 feet 10 inches into total number of inches. So first you've got to remember that 1 inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. Uh, and in the case where the equation may require meters, you can simply say 1 inch is equal to 0. 0. 0.0254 meters. So consequently, 5 feet 10 inches is equal to 70 inches. 5 feet times 12, 60 plus 10, 70. And then 70 times 2.54 gives 177.8 centimeters. Again, leave one or two numbers after the decimal point, but don't round them up. Here's a little problem to help you work with the decimal points. So if a man weighs 189 pounds, what would his weight be in grams? Now grams would be an unusual unit to use for weight. It's usually kilograms. But I'm using grams here to see if you know how to use the decimal points. So I'll let you work on this and reveal the answer on the next slide. All right, the correct answer would be D. Now let's take a look at how this uh, particular calculation was done. If we take the 189 pounds, we multiply it by 0.454, as we previously indicated, to get the kilogram weight. We get a kilogram weight of 85.81 kilograms. We know that one kilogram is equal to 1,000 grams. So then 85.8 times 1,000 gives us 85,806 grams. So that turns out to be D. Now let's do a similar calculation using height. So if we have a man whose height is 5 feet 7 inches, what would it be uh, in centimeters? So I'll pause here and uh, indicate the answer on the next slide. The correct answer would be 170.18. So again, the thing to remember is that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So we need to calculate the number of inches in five feet, seven inches. So that's 67 inches, five times 12, 60, plus the seven inches, 67. 67 inches times 2.54 centimeters per inch gives us 170.18 centimeters. Let's try another one. A woman who is 5 feet 10 inches tall would be how many meters tall? Again, always remember that 1 inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters or 1 inch is equal to 0.0, .0 254 meters. So 5 feet 10 inches would be 70 inches. And since 1 inch is equal to 0 0.0254 meters, we would just multiply 70 times 0 0.0254 and we would get 1.78 meters. So the correct answer would be B. Well, now I'm reintroducing percent calculations as I did at the beginning of the course. So now I want you to calculate the percent fat calories in a slice of pie. If the slice of pie contains a total of 350 calories, and if there are 32 grams of fat per serving, what percent of the calories are coming from fat? I'll pause the video here, calculate your answer, and I'll reveal it on the next slide. The correct answer is 82.28%. How did I calculate it? Well, there are 32 grams of fat, so we'll get the fat calories by multiplying 32 by 9, and that's 288, and the one slice of pie had 350 calories, so we divide that amount by 350 calories, and we get 82.28%.
Let's do another problem. If your diet contains 300 grams of carbohydrate, identify how many calories uh, would come from carbohydrates. Now this one is relatively easy since we know that there are four calories for every gram of carbohydrate and since there are 300 grams the answer would be C, 1200 calories. So let's try this problem. If a hamburger patty weighing two ounces contains 14 grams of protein and 16 grams of fat, how many calories uh, or kilocalories are in the patty? So the answer will be dependent on you acknowledging that calories come in this case from protein and from fat and that there are four calories for every gram of protein, nine calories for every gram of fat. So now it's a matter of identifying correctly uh, what the calories and or kilocalories are in this patty. So let's do the calculations. First we do the protein calculation. We have 14 grams times 4. So we have 56 um, calories coming from protein, 16 grams of fat. So that means that we have 144 calories coming from fat plus the 56 from protein gives us 200 kilocalories. But we also know that there are um, that one calorie or a thousand calories is found in one kilocalorie so we would need to multiply the 200 by a thousand and we would get 200,000 calories so we actually have A and D being correct 200 kilocalories is indeed equal to 200,000 um, calories but in nutrition when we speak about calories calories we generally refer to as the kilocalories. So for instance, a person whose energy daily energy requirement is 2,800 calories, we really are jargonizing. That is indeed uh, 2,800 kilocalories. Let's do another percent calculation. So a food contains a total of 650 calories with um, a fat content equal to 44 grams of fat. What percent of the calories are coming from fat? Time to pause the video. I'll give you the answer on the next slide. The correct answer is roughly 61%. How is this calculated? Well remember first of all don't make the critical mistake of dividing grams by calories. When you're doing a percentage it has to be the numerator having the same unit as the denominator. That's a very basic principle. It's 10 apples over 100 apples. So you can't have 44 grams over 650 calories. So you've got to convert the, ca the grams, 44, into calories, 9 calories for every gram. So we have 396 uh, fat calories. And we divide that by the total, which is 650, and multiply it by 100, and we get 61%. Another way to visualize or help a patient visualize the sugar content that they are consuming, for example, in a 12 ounce fluid Coke. So if we look at the ingredients and there's 39 grams of sugar, uh, a good way to use to help the patient understand uh, how much they're actually consuming in sugar is to convert the grams into teaspoons. And so what we understand is one teaspoon is equal to four grams of sugar. So this is very important to remember because it helps in that conversion. So 39 grams then divided by four gives us 9.75 teaspoons of sugar. Or a dietitian would basically say, Mrs. Smith, uh, in that 12 ounce fluid ounce of Coke, you're consuming roughly 12 or 10 teaspoons of sugar. So now let's consider a calculation that looks at yearly sugar consumption. That also is very helpful um, to um, bringing a patient to understanding how much sugar they're actually consuming. So if your patient is consuming uh, 8 ounces of fruit juice 4 times per day every day and the sugar content is 30 grams per 8 ounce cup, determine the pounds of sugar consumed per year. So 30 grams uh, of sugar multiplied by 4 gives us 120 
grams of sugar per day, right? Because that eight ounce cup is consumed four times. So that's 120 grams of sugar per day. And since they're consuming this amount every day, that's 365 days a year, then the person is consuming 43,800 grams of sugar per year. That's 120 times the number of days in a year, 365. Now, since one pound is equal to 454 grams, then the 43,800 grams, if you divide it by 454 grams, will give you the number of pounds. That's 96.48 pounds of sugar per year, just from the consumption um, of eight ounce fruit juice four times a day. Let's do another calculation. Determine the yearly intake of sugar, but break it down into monthly intakes. So a man consumes three 12 ounce Mountain Dews per day, containing 46 grams of sugar per 12 fluid ounces, three days per week. How many pounds of sugar does he consume on average per month over that year? Let me pause right here, right? So pause the video and I'll give you the answer on the next slide. All right, the correct answer is 3.95 pounds per month. So how did we calculate this? Well, let's consider the number of grams of sugar consumed per day. So the patient consumes three 12 fluid ounce Mountain Dews per day, and one 12 fluid ounce contains 46 grams. So 46 times three gives us the number of grams of sugar per consumed day. So 138. He consumes that three days a week. So let's multiply that by three. And what we get is 414 grams per week. We know there are 52 weeks in a year. There are not four weeks in a month. That is actually incorrect. So the only certifiable way to approach this is to recognize for certain that there are 52 weeks in a year. So if we have the number of grams of sugar for a week, we multiply that by 52 and we get the number of grams of sugar for a year, 21,528. That amount can then be divided by 12 because we know that there are 12 months in a year. So divide that by 12, and that gives us 1,794 grams of sugar per month. Well, since there are 454 grams in a pound, divide that amount by 454, and you get 3.95 pounds per month. All right, in this next question, we're going to go back to the teaspoon concept. So if a person consumes six 20 fluid ounce Mountain Dews per day, that's a lot. How much sugar per year does he consume if one 20 fluid ounce container of Mountain Dew has 16 teaspoons of sugar? I'll pause it right here. Uh, and then the next slide, I'll reveal the answer. The correct answer to this problem is 309 pounds. So let's do the calculation. First, we know there's 16 teaspoons of sugar in a 20 fluid ounce Mountain Dew. How many grams? Well, 16 times four, because there are four grams for every teaspoon. So we have 64 grams of sugar in every 20 fluid ounce of Mountain Dew. The person consumes six of these every day. So times six means that they're consuming 384 grams of sugar every day, and there are 365 days in a year, so multiply that by 365, and you should get 140,160 grams. There are 454 grams in a pound, so if we divide that by 454, we will get 308.72, or round it up, 309 pounds of sugar. So here's another problem that helps you with some quantification. So one 156 gram bag of potato chips contains what quantity of fat if one ounce of chips equals 10 grams of fat? Pause the video here and I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. 
The correct answer is B, 55.71 grams. Let's see how I calculated this. I begin with uh, recognizing that in one ounce chips, there's 10 grams of fat. But I have a problem. The bag weighs 156 grams. So I have to convert the one ounce of chips into grams of chips. And I know, or at least you should know, that one ounce is equal to 28 grams. So if I know that 28 grams of chips has 10 grams of fat, then I can determine how much fat is in 156 grams of chips. So that's 156 grams times 10 divided by 28. The answer, B. So now I want to look at what we regard as a nutrient density. This is something that a dietitian or nutritionist wants his patient to consume, a diet high in nutrient density. So how is it represented? The correct answer is C. It's the quantity of nutrient expressed as milligrams or micrograms per individual calorie. Let's do a nutrient density calculation. Calculate the nutrient density of one 156-gram fresh baked potato if the niacin content of that potato is 2.8 milligrams and the calories found in that potato is 145 calories. I'll pause here and I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. So the correct answer is 15 micrograms per kilocalorie. So let's take a look at how I calculated this. Well, first we understand that nutrient density is the quantity divided by the calories. So the quantity here is 2.18 milligrams. So we're going to divide that by the number of calories, which is um, 145 calories in that potato. And we end up with 0 0.015 milligrams per calorie. And you can see in option C uh, that that isn't the correct answer. C is 0 0.0015. The correct answer in milligrams would be 0 0.015 milligrams per calorie. So C is wrong because it's actually uh, 10 times smaller. Now, what about 15 micrograms? Well, uh, the idea is that um, uh, is that the uh, microgram is a thousand times smaller than the actual milligram. So we would have to then uh, multiply um, 0 0.015 uh, by 1,000 and change, of course, the unit. So if we multiply that, 1,000, we end up with 15.03. And in this case, it would be micrograms. So it's important to have a little bit of flexibility here in terms of understanding micrograms and milligrams. So for ease, we could say, for instance, that 1,000 grams is equal to 1 kilogram. We can also add to that that 1,000 milligrams is equal to 1 gram. And now to better understand this problem, we can say that 1,000 micrograms is equal to 1 milligram. This should help you to better understand the resolution of the previous problem. In nutrient counseling, while we advocate for foods of high nutrient density, we actually try to encourage individuals to eat foods of low caloric density. So in this particular question, uh, let's uh, see how much you understand of caloric density. What is the caloric density of a 156 gram bag of potatoes if the total calories is equal to 836 calories? Pause the video here. I'll show you the answer on the next slide. Hopefully you remembered the definition. It's the number of calories per gram weight uh, of the product. So we have 836 calories in a bag of potato chips that weighs 156 grams. So we can take 836 divided by 156 and we get 5.36 calories per gram. 
Now I want to spend some time looking at the key calculations used for the determination of energy needs and for diet prescription. The first um, calculation that I'd like to introduce to you is the determining of resting energy expenditure or REE. The method recommended in the book is to begin with the Mifflin equation. This establishes the resting energy expenditure which is the first step in determining the total energy expenditure which we'll see later on. So I'd like to show you that in this equation the men and women equations are very similar. The women is 5 times the age plus 161 and uh, the for the male it's 5 times the age minus 5 in the last bracket but aside from that the two equations resemble each other and you can see why we were determining the metric conversions because in this first one for men it's 10 times the weight in kilograms so you need to take that body weight as we were doing previously multiply it by 0.454 and insert it in this particular parentheses the height is in centimeters so height in inches times 6.25 and so the approach here is first of all memorize this um, equation know it cold so that all you need to do is insert by memory into your into your uh, calculator uh, the different parameters adding them together and subtracting and coming up with the REE when I do this in the classroom students can eventually do this in 45 seconds so I recommend this a particular objective for you as you practice this equation to do it under a minute. Now the REE is really the energy expended by the individual when they are in the supine or the lying down position. So it's the resting energy expenditure. So it really is measuring the energy that is used by the organs and the muscles and the brain while in a state of relaxation. Let's do an example. A 35-year-old man weighing 250 pounds with a height of 5 foot 10. Determine this individual's resting energy expenditure using the Mifflin equation. So I have the Mifflin equation um, written out here. And if you've memorized it, then you will do first the conversion of the body weight. So 250 pounds times 0.454 and you get 113.5. So that 113.5, because you've memorized it, will multiply the 10, and that gives you basically 1,135. Now you can write this down quickly on a piece of paper. The next thing is 5 foot 10, so that's 70 inches. 70 inches uh, times 2.54 to get the centimeters, so 70 times 2.54 and you get 177.8. That 177.8, you know by memory, gets multiplied by 6.25, and you get 1,111.25. That value will then add to um, the 1,135 from the previous uh, parentheses, and you will get then... Um, the um, total for the first bracket, which would be 2,246.25. The next is to do the uh, age. And so it's 5 times his age minus 5. And the, so then that value is minus 170. So when we actually add the 1135 to the 1111.25 minus the 70 we get 2076 calories now this gives us the resting energy expenditure but now in order to get the total energy expenditure we need to multiply that by an activity factor My choice of activity factors are going to be selected from table 2.4 in your textbook. And I've summarized them right here, but this is just a brief um, uh, example of what you'll find. But the idea being that if you're doing a light activity, uh, it's going to be 1.53 for a man and for a woman. A moderate activity is 1.76 and a heavy activity is 2.25. So in order to get the total energy activity, um, level if we're using for example a moderate activity you would take the REE which we just determined 
times the activity level of moderate activity, 1.76, and that gives us 3,654 calories. This is the total energy expenditure uh, of the energy of the individual. So the amount of energy required uh, for consumption uh, in order to maintain um, a stable. Now the second method for determining not the REE but the TEE and it can be done in just one equation is called the Garrier equation and you can see it's a little bit more complicated so consequently I don't require that students memorize this one but it would be a really good idea to write down uh, on a cheat sheet um, the two equations for men and women. So for a man, for example, who's very active, uh, we're going to look at the TE being equal to 864 minus, and in the parentheses, 9.72 times the age in years. And that forms the first bracket. So this is the one you should begin with, plus the physical activity. Your choice of physical activity, if you're using the Garrier equation, is table 2.5 in your textbook. this physical activity that you'll select in the case of a very active individual uh, and if it's a man uh, you'll be using activity factor 1.54 if it was a woman that was very active it would be 1.45 so consult table 2.5 now I want you to take note of the physical activity multiplying the addition of 14.2 times the weight and of 503 times the height, right? So it's the two together that are actually getting multiplied by uh, the PA or the physical activity. So now I want to resolve this equation. So just go down to the second level and we see that the 8.64 minus 9.72 times the age and the age is 35. So really what we do is resolve that first bracket. So 9.72 times 35 and that value will be subtracted from 864 and so you can write down on a piece of paper uh, the first bracket 528 point or 523.8. Now the activity factor is 1.54 and that's going to multiply 14.2 times the weight. So the weight's got to be in kilo, uh, kilograms. So it's 14.2 times 113.5. And then the height is got to be made into meters, not centimeters. That's 503 times 1.78. So what you're looking at is the 1.54 multiplying the summation of those two last parentheses. So I've tried to break down the calculations for you. So now down to the lower level, we have the TEE with the first bracket, 523.8, plus then we have 1,611.7 plus 895.3 within when combined together within that uh, parentheses. And we have the activity factor multiplying the addition of those two. So when we do that, the one 1611.7 plus 895.3 times 1.54 that gives 3861 that gets added then to the 523.8 which you did initially and that gives us the calories of 4385 calories this is the total energy expenditure of that individual who is very active So students should spend a considerable amount of time uh, rehearsing different problems with the Garrier equation, again, using the cheat sheet, and avoiding having to write down everything. Remember, if you have the cheat sheet, you can visualize where you can enter your numbers, and then maybe drop down maybe one or two numbers that come out of your calculator. The idea is that when I do this in class, students do it in about a minute, 30 seconds on average. So I would encourage students to try this particular equation and train enough that you would get the answer, uh, the correct answer, nine times out of 10, uh, within about a minute to a minute and 30 seconds. This will allow you to perform well on the rapid response quiz. Now in this section, I'm going to show you how to prescribe a diet to a patient. 
given his total caloric requirements of 4,385 calories per day, for instance, um, it would be pertinent to prescribe certain amounts of carbs and proteins and fat. And I want to show you how to proceed. So to prescribe appropriately, you need to follow the um, macronutrient range recommendations for healthy eating. So you need to know that carbohydrates, uh, the recommendation there is for 45 to 65% of the DRI calories. Again, I always mention DRI calories because I want students to remember that when you establish these ranges, you're not using the person's actual calorie consumption, but the recommended calories that they should be consuming. Protein 10 to 35 and fat 20 to 35 percent. So these are the percent ranges from which you can select for your um, specific patient's needs. So as the dietitians, for example, I will be selecting my specific carbohydrate protein fat prescription based on those recommendations we just saw. So for instance, in my prescription for my particular patient, I might prescribe 60% of the calories coming from carbs. This is actually quite consistent with the range 45 to 65. My protein perhaps might be 15% of the calories. That's clearly between the 10 to 35. And or I might actually use body weight maybe the equivalent here of about 1.35 grams per kilogram body weight of protein. Remembering that the weight or the gram amount of protein um, per body weight is a more precise way of prescribing protein. And fat, I might prescribe 25% and I can see here that it's clearly between uh, the healthy range of 20 to 35%. So if my patient's uh, energy requirement is 4,385 calories a day, then I would say if 60% of my calories are coming from carbs, I can calculate uh, the gram amount of carbs that that patient would receive. That would be 0.6 times 4,385 divided by 4, 658 grams of carb. Protein at 15%, 0.15 times 4385 calories. Divide that by 4, because there are 4 calories from every gram. That gives me 164 grams of protein. And then 25% from fat, 0.25 times 4385. Divide this by 9, and that's 122 grams. Now make sure that the addition of these percentages come up to 100. So let's just verify. 60 plus 15. That's 75, plus the 25 from fat is indeed 100%. So I'd like to take a closer look at the various recommendations for fluid requirements. In 1945, the Nutrition Food Board of the National Research Council recommended about 1 mil per kilocalorie. So that means that an individual, for instance, whose requirement is 2,000 calories a day, would require 2,000 milliliters. Now that total would account for the liquids that we consume in food as well as from drink. The NHANES study that was conducted between 1988 and 1994 showed basically that the AI for young adults and middle-aged adults should be about 3.7 liters for men and 2.7 liters for women. That would be the total water intake, and that would also include the water in the food. At a practical level, this means that given that 20% of our fluids come from food, uh, organizations like the ESPEN organization recognizes that the actual amount of fluid ingested uh, by women should be about 1.6 liters a day, and by men, about 2 liters a day. So now let's take a closer look at these recommendations. If we look at the ranges of 2.5 to 3.7 liters for men and 2 to 2.7 liters for women, we know that this AI is referring to the total fluid requirement for the body, which includes fluids that we drink and the fluids that are found in the food. Is there a way to reconcile that with the ESPEN guidelines, which appear to be less, but which pertain to the actual fluid that we need to drink? So now if we estimate 80% of these liter volumes, we will derive the uh, volume of fluid that we need to drink. 
Well, if we take the lower end of each range, so notably 2 liters for women and 2.5 liters for men, and we calculate 80% of that um, a minimum recommendation, notably um, 2 liters for women, we end up with 1.6 liters for women. If we do the 2.5 uh, liters and calculate 80%, we end up with two liters per day for men. So indeed, the AI and the ESPEN guidelines can be reconciled. Right now I have a set of training mini quizzes that you can do with this particular presentation. They're not compiled uh, and, and they don't go towards your grade sheet, but they are an excellent way to train and really understand, make sure that you understand the key concepts. Identify below the recommended carbohydrate intake in order to meet the healthy macronutrient range for carbohydrate. The answer, D, 45 to 65 percent. Next question, identify below the recommended protein intake in order to meet the healthy macronutrient range for protein. The answer is C, 10 to 35 percent of DRI calories. Next, identify below the recommended fat intake in order to meet uh, the healthy macronutrient range for fat. The answer, C, 20 to 35 percent of DRI calories. A man weighing 189 pounds with a height of 5 foot 9, calculate his weight in kilograms. The answer, 85.81 kilograms. Calculated as follows, 189 pounds times 0.454 kilograms. Another question, a man weighing 189 pounds whose height is 5 foot 9, calculate his height in meters. The answer for this one is C, 1.75 meters. How is this calculated? You have to recall the conversion. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. Since we're working in meters, we can say one inch equals 0 0.0254 meters. So now you take the 5 feet 9 inches, which is 69 inches times 0 0.0254 and you get C, 1.75 meters. Next question, a woman drinks 5 12 fluid ounce Cokes a day, five days a week. If one 12 fluid ounce Coke contains 12 teaspoons of sugar, how many pounds of sugar does she consume after one week? So pause this video, calculate, and I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. The answer is C. How did we calculate this? Well, a 12 fluid ounce Coke has 12 teaspoons. So let's see how many grams there is in one 12 fluid ounce Coke. So four grams per teaspoon. So there's 48 grams of sugar in one 12 fluid ounce Coke. The person drinks five of these a day, so times five. So in a full day consumption, this person drinks 240 grams of sugar. She does this five days a week, so we multiply that amount times five, and we get 1,200 grams. Since one pound equals 454 grams, we divide the 1,200 by 454, and we get 2.64 pounds. Here's another question about sugar. So a woman drinks five 12 fluid ounce Cokes a day, five days a week. Uh, if there are 12 teaspoons in a 12 fluid ounce Coke, how many pounds of sugar does she consume after one month? Pause here and I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. The correct answer is actually E, 11.45 pounds. So how is this done? Well, similar to the previous one, 12 teaspoons of sugar in one 12 ounce. So four teaspoons 
uh, 4 grams uh, per teaspoon, so that's 48 grams. The person consumes it five, day, um, five times a day, so that's 240 grams a day. Consumes it five times a week, so times five. So on a weekly basis, 1,200 grams. Now, that's per week we're looking at per month. So we have to go first per year because we know there are 52 weeks in a year. So we'll do that times 52. So that's 62,400 grams per year. And we know that there are 12 months in a year. So we can divide that by 12. And we get 5,200 grams per, um, per month. And since there are four, um, 454 grams in a pound, we divide that by 454 and we get 1145 pounds per month. So now let's do an estimate for one year. Same um, description, a woman drinks five 12 fluid ounce Cokes a day, five days a week. If one 12 ounce Coke has 12 teaspoons, how many pounds at the end of one year? I'll pause here, do the calculations, and I'll provide the answer on the next slide. The answer that you should have come up with is 137.4 pounds per year. So back to the 12 teaspoons, that's 48 grams of sugar. That's taken five times a day. So that turns into 240 grams of sugar a day. And then um, we then multiply that by five for five times a week. That equals uh, 1,200 grams a week. And there are 52 weeks in one year. So you multiply that amount by 52. And you get 62,400 grams of sugar. And you know that one pound is 454 grams. So divide that by 454 and you get the 137.4 pounds of sugar per year. Before you commence this problem, be sure that you memorize the Mifflin equation. And now this will give you an opportunity to practice with a memorized equation. So now looking at this um, particular problem, you can see it's a man. So that means you need to draw the male Mifflin equation, which is 10 times the weight in kilograms um, plus 6.25 the height in centimeters, close brackets, minus open brackets, 5 times the age minus 5, close brackets. The goal now is to complete this equation in 45 seconds. So you're only going to jot down on a piece of paper perhaps two numbers. The rest will simply be put into the calculator having memorized the equation. So the first thing is that the weight needs to be transformed into kilograms. 1.78 times 0.454 equals 80.81. And you know that amount gets multiplied by 10. So immediately multiply that amount by 10 and you get 801.12. Jot that number down. 808.12. Now let's move to the height. The height then needs to be transformed into inches. So 6 feet is 72 inches plus 2 is 74. This is using centimeters, so that's 2.54 centimeters to an inch. So multiply 74 by 2.54. That amount is 187.96, and you know by memory that that amount gets multiplied by 6.25, and the number you jot down here, uh, or that you don't actually jot down, that you see is 1174.75. That amount actually gets added to the number you just jotted down, which is the 808.12, so let's do that. 1174.75 uh, plus 808.12. And now you get the first number that goes into the first bracket, 1982.87. Next, we subtract the age factor. So remember, this is a man. So the age is 55 times 5 minus 5. 
the number you get is 270. This amount will be subtracted from the first number in your bracket, 1982.87. So let's do the calculation, 1982.87 minus 270. The answer you should get is 1713 or 1713 kilocalories. This is the resting energy expenditure as determined by the Mifflin equation. Now, if one slice of pizza contains 43 grams of fat, and if the slice has 631 calories, what percent of the calories come from fat? Pause here, do the calculation, I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. The answer you should have come up with is D, 61.33%. Let's do the calculation. 43 grams of fat. Remember, you can't do 43 over 631. They're two different units. So 43 grams have got to be transformed into calories, and that is done by multiplying by 9. So we have 387 fat calories divided by 631 total calories times 100. We get 61.33% D. This question is about uh, using the Garrier equation for total energy expenditure. And I have here outlined the formula. What we know about the case is that it's a man who's 27 years old, whose weight is 173 pounds, whose height is 5 foot 11, and whose activity factor we have here is equal to 1.27. If you consult uh, table uh, 2.5 in your textbook, you'll see that 1.27 for a man is active. So at this point, you should pause the video, do the calculations using the Garrier equation for a man, and then reopen or restart the video, and I'll show you the answer and explain it. If you're well practiced, you should be able to do this particular resolution in 1 minute 30 seconds. So for this kind of a problem, because the Gary equation is difficult to memorize, you should have it down as a cheat sheet right in front of you and don't waste your time jotting every single number down or rewriting the equation. That's the value of the cheat sheet. So the first place to start is with the first bracket dealing with the age. So let's do that by entering the, the number or the age of the person. So it's 27 years old times 9.72. That gives us 262.44. That subtracts 864. And we get 601.56. That goes in to your first bracket. Put a bracket around it so you don't get mixed up in your numbers. Next, we put the uh, we replace the PA by the actual activity factor or AF, and so in the place of PA we put 1.27, and that is going to multiply the summation of the weight and height factors. So after you've done that, then you need to convert the body weight into kilograms. So let's do that: 173 times 0.454 and we get 78.54. That value then multiplies 14.2, and we get 11.15.30. Jot that down, and then now move to the age, or to the height, sorry. So the height is 5 feet 11, so that's 71 inches. Remember here we're working in meters, so 71 inches times 0.0254. So that gives us 1.8034 meters. Just leave that into your um, um, calculator reading. And that height in meters then multiplies 503. And so we get 907.11. No need to write that one down. Now simply add it to the weight factor that you previously did, which was 1115.30, so that gets added, plus 1115.30. That forms the total number of the second bracket. That value then multiplies 1.27, so we do that, 
and we should get uh, 2,568, 2,568 point 46. That value then adds the value you obtained in your first bracket, 601.56. So this value then adds 601.56 and you get 3,170. Here's a dietary reference intake question. What DRI is used by government policymakers in order to establish agricultural policies for a nation based on mean population needs? Pause here, think about it, and put down your answer. I'll reveal the correct answer immediately after. The correct answer is D, the EAR, the estimated average requirement. This is the requirement that is, that's established to meet uh, the needs of 50% of the population. The next DRI question is which of the following statements is true regarding the RDA? Pause the uh, movie and uh, select your answer. The correct answer is B. The risk of nutrient deficiency actually increases the further the intake of that nutrient falls below the RDA. So what we determined in the class is when you're less or equal to 66% of the RDA, you're at a very high risk of deficiency. But when you're at 75%, the risk is not quite as high statistically. But this actual statement holds true. The further you drop below, the, the greater the risk of a deficiency occurring. Here's another DRI question. The EAR meets the needs of what percent of the population? Stop the video here. I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. The correct answer to this one is C, 50% of the population. The EAR is the estimated average requirement, and it's scientifically determined in order to meet the needs of 50% of the population. And a reminder that the RDA is determined by adding two standard deviations to the EAR in order to um, meet the needs of 98% of the population. Here's a critical thinking question. You're trying to teach a client how to possibly lower blood cholesterol levels by consuming foods high in fiber. Which of the following foods would be least effective for this purpose? Pause the video, think about it, maybe read a bit about fiber in your chapter, and then I'll reveal the correct answer on the next slide. Because it's well recognized that soluble fibers are effective in decreasing cholesterol, uh, we can identify whole wheat bread, which is mostly insoluble fiber, as being a food the least effective in bringing down blood cholesterol. Here's a question to see if you memorize the essential amino acids. If you haven't, go back to the earlier um, slides of this program and apply yourself to memorize all nine of the essential amino acids. And in this question, correctly identify the list made up of only essential amino acids. Pause here, review your material, select your answer, and I'll reveal the correct answer after the next slide. If you memorize that sentence correctly, then it should sound something like this. Lucy, and so Lucy, and Valerie, all three lied about having met for an historical phenomenal trip. And we can see that Anso Lucy is ISO or also Lucy, three Lucy, and phenylalanine for phenomenal. So B is the correct answer. Now for a calculation question. A man weighing 170 pounds consumes 3,050 calories and has a DRI requirement for 3,350 calories. Identify below uh, his lower cutoff for monounsaturated fat. Pause here, figure out your answer, select, and I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. 
To answer this question correctly, you have to have memorized the recommended cutoff for the fats. For monounsaturated fat, you should know that it's equal to or greater than 11%. If you don't know this, then you need to go back to focus box 2.1 and look at the second column in the table. And this is the second column that you're supposed to memorize. Here you'll see monounsaturated fats greater or equal than 11% of the DRI calories. And you can read about it a little bit more in the second uh, paragraph, page 54. If you did the correct calculation, then you should have the following answer, B, greater or equal to 41 grams. How was that calculation done? Well, first of all, a reminder that uh, when you're um, looking at cutoffs or standards, you never use the calories consumed, but really the calories recommended, the DRIs. So you would end up with the wrong answer if you use 3050, the correct answer if you use 3350. So that's the recommended amount of energy, and it's 11% or greater. So let's do 11% times 0.11. That gives us 368.5 calories and we need to divide that by 9 because it's a fat and we get 40.9 or in other words 41 grams of monounsaturated fat or more. Here's another DRI question. Identify the daily value for carbohydrates that was used on the old nutrition facts panel. Pause here, find your answer. If you remember uh, the FDA estimated this daily value assuming a 2,000 calorie diet and 60% of those calories coming from carbohydrates. So if you do the calculation, 2,000 times 0. 0.6, that's 1,200 calories. Divide that by 4, and that leaves you with 300 grams of carbohydrate. The new facts panel has 285 grams of carbohydrates as the DV. Here's another DRI question. Identify the daily value for fiber used on the old Nutrition Facts panel. Pause here and find your answer. The correct answer is D, 25 grams. The new Nutrition Facts panel has the DV at 28 grams. Before answering this question, be sure to consult figure 2.5 in your textbook and learn those oils very well. So the question is, which of the following vegetable oils is a good source of omega-3 alpha linolenic acid? Pause here and try to figure out the correct answer. In consulting figure 2.5, you should be able to uh, remember here that flaxseed has the highest concentration of uh, linolenic acid, the omega-3 fatty acid. So the answer is E. Omega-3 fatty acids that are found in flaxseed are also found in fish oils and consequently they tend to be anti-inflammatory uh, and anti-thrombotic, therefore decreasing the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now by contrast, the omega-6 fatty acids, which are uh, really the yellow oils, the oils that are uh, rich in linoleic acid, these are pro-inflammatory once you start consuming more than 10% of the DRI calories. And so they tend to increase the risk of cardiovascular accidents um, through um, inflammation, or we call microinflammation. Now for another oil question, which of the oils are rich in monounsaturated fats? Pause here and select your correct answer. You will note that the correct answer is E, B, and C. So beef tallow, even though it has a lot of saturated fat, actually has a, a significant amount of monounsaturated fat. And of course, the oil that has the most amount of uh, monounsaturated oil is olive oil. Here's another oil question. Which of the oils are rich in monounsaturated fats? 
the correct answer is B, peanut oil, olive oil, and canola oil. If you're having trouble with this, memorize figure 2.5. You need to know this cold. Next question, what is the daily value for total fat used on the new Nutrition Facts panel? Pause here and determine your correct answer. You'll remember that the old facts panel used to assume 30% of a 2,000 calorie diet. Now the new facts panel assumes the upper level of healthy fat, which is 35% of a 2,000 calorie diet, and that is 78 grams. Here's an interesting assessment question regarding fiber. The Nutrition Facts panel on breakfast cereals indicate that one serving contains three grams of fiber. How would you rate that cereal based on our standard understanding of how to interpret the Facts panel? You'll recall that the new daily value for the new Facts panel is 28 grams. So three divided by 28 times 100 gives us approximately 11%. So this is considered a good source of fiber because it's between 10 and 19.9% of the daily value. The next question pertains to total sugar. The Nutrition Facts panel on a breakfast cereal indicates that one serving contains 16 grams of sugar. How would you rate the sugar content of the cereal based on the standard 2,000 kilocalorie a day diet? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer would be B, moderately high in sugar. How is this calculated? Again, remember the cutoff for total sugar is not established by the government, but we can, within the context of this course, use the NIH data that basically says 20% um, or less than 20% of uh, calories should come from sugar because over that, uh, dietary quality goes down. So if we use 20%, we can calculate 20% of 2,000 um, divided by 4 gives us 100 grams. So 16 over 100 is 16%. So we know that the percentage interpretation is as follows. 10 to 19.9 is essentially moderately high in sugar. Here's a Mifflin equation. Um, and here is specifically what you're trying to achieve is the resting energy expenditure of a 24-year-old woman with a weight of 223 pounds and a height of 5 foot 7 inches. So the goal here is to come up with the resolution within about 45 seconds. So pause here and time yourself. You should have memorized the Mifflin equation. The correct answer to this question uh, is D, 1,795 calories. How was this determined? Well, very quickly, the weight, 223 times 0. 0.454, 101.24 times 10, and that gives us 10, 12.42. We then move over to the height, 57, or 5 feet 7 inches, 67 inches, times 2.54, and that amount times 6.25. This gives you 1063.63. You add that to the number you previously counted, which is 1012.42, and you end up with 2076 in the first bracket. Now the age, 24 times 5, plus 161. So 281 will subtract 2076, and you end up with 1,795 calories. Please continue to practice until you can do this in about 45 seconds. In this question, identify below which of the five food products are considered healthy based on the new government criteria. Pause the video and make your selection. Well, can it be option A? Well, let's take a look at it. So three grams of fat based on the new DV of 78 uh, represents really a 3.8% of the DV. So automatically we can rule out A because it's less than 5%. Remember, fat cannot be 
uh, low in, uh, the fat content cannot be low. So let's go to 3.5. 3.5, um, divide that by 78 grams, and we get 4.5. And so we're still less than 5%. What if we do 5 grams? So 5 divided by 78 and we get 6.4 so at least we meet the criteria here in number C that it's not low in fat now let's look at the fat profile the PUFA and the MUFAs together need to be more than the saturated fat if we do that we get to see that the, actually PUFA and MUFA together is 4.5 and the saturated is fat so the pro is um, the saturated is 0.5 so we see a better profile of fats healthier preponderance of PUFAs and MUFAs which are the good fats relative to the poor fat which is saturated fat when we look at the micronutrient uh, vitamin D we see that it's at 15 percent of the DV so it is at least 10 percent so it could be either one or the other but in this case we have both when we look at total fat at four grams it's a little less they have sodium that's focused on there's no healthy fat profile in the D option so it can't be that one and the same thing for E there's no healthy fat profile there's only saturated fat we don't see the PUFAs or the MUFAs which are the polyunsaturates and the monounsaturates and we see that the total fat is at two grams which is low so the correct answer then is C the next question is sort of a prescription question a 38 year old female client whose DRI calories is 2,544 calories a day, is prescribed a diet containing 45% carbs, 20 protein, and 35% fat. Identify below the gram representation of that prescription. Pause the video and uh, calculate your answers. Now, the correct answer should be C. Now, why is it C? It's C because if you calculate 2544 calories, 2544 calories multiplied by um, 0.45, which is 45%, divide that by 4, you get 286. So the carbs at 286 is good. The protein then at 20%, we do the same calculation, 2544 times 0.2 divided by 4 and we get 127 so far so good and then we do fat at 35 so 0.35 times 2544 divide that by 9 and we get 98 or 99 if we round it up and hence the correct answer is C here's a Mifflin equation a time again to test your ability to resolve this in a timely manner you're going to be referred to though to table 2.4 in your textbook for activity level the activity level that's used here um, is going to be a light activity and it's important also to recognize that you're not calculating here the REE with the Mifflin equation but you're actually using the Mifflin equation and the activity factor to derive the total energy expenditure. So stop your um, uh, video right here and then uh, try to come up with the correct answer. If you did the calculation correctly, you should end up with A as the correct answer, 2,746. So let's see how this was done. And again, hopefully uh, you've trained enough that you're able to um, get the results of this particular equation uh, in about 45 to 50 seconds. So it always starts off with the body weight here, changing that into kilograms. So if you did it correctly, you should get 101.24 kilos. That gets multiplied by 10. And so you end up with 1,012.42 uh, in your first calculation. And then you do the height and the height in this case is uh, 5 foot 7 or 67 inches times 2.54 and that gives you 170.18 centimeters times 6.25 and you get 
1,063.62, which then uh, adds your previous result of 1,012.42, and you should get in that first bracket 2,076. Now, you should do the age. This is a woman, so it's 25, 24, sorry, times 5, plus 161. That's 281. So 281 will subtract 2076. The result should be 1,795. You multiply that amount. Remember, we're not doing the REE, but the TEE. So you multiply that REE amount by 1.53, which is the light activity, and you get 2,746 kilocalories. All right, now here's a set of mini questions on carbohydrates. Again, these don't go towards your final grade. All right, the first question is to identify the disaccharide sugar that is mostly found in fruit. Remember, the key is that it's a disaccharide. So the correct answer is sucrose. Sucrose is indeed a disaccharide. Uh, formed of glucose and fructose. Uh, glucose is actually a monosaccharide, fructose is a monosaccharide, and lactose is a disaccharide formed of glucose and galactose. All right, identify the two monosaccharides that result from the activity of the digestive enzyme lactase on the sugar lactose. Stop your video here and select your answer. The correct answer should be D, galactose and glucose. Next question, which of the following monosaccharides are responsible for the sweet taste of fruit? Stop the video and select your answer. The correct answer is B, fructose. Fructose is indeed significantly more sweeter than glucose and it is specifically the fructose that gives that prominent sweet taste. Here's the next question. Which of the following is not a complex carbohydrate? Stop the video and select your answer. So the correct answer is actually C, galactose. Galacto galactose is a monosaccharide, so a one unit sugar. Uh, most fibers are actually complex carbs. Glycogen, even though it's in the muscle, is structured as a complex carb. And starches, as we know, uh, the amylopectin and the amylose, these are actually complex carbs, complex starches. Now let's take a few minutes and do some fiber questions. So among the ingredients listed below, identify the one that consists mostly of insoluble fiber. Stop the video here, select your answer. If you remember, there are two types of fiber, insoluble and soluble. Insoluble fiber doesn't really absorb water, but it does draw water into the intestine. Uh, but because it doesn't solubilize in water, uh, it doesn't have that ability um, to basically capture cholesterol. Uh, so the one that is the most insoluble is the wheat bran. The oat bran, the pectins, and the mucilage are all considered hydrocolloids or soluble fibers that form a sort of a fermentation in the gastrointestinal gut. So in that sense, soluble fibers are fermentable. But insoluble fibers are not fermentable. Next question, identify the property that is associated with soluble fibers. Stop the video here and select your answer. The correct answer is C they can lower the blood cholesterol. This is because they form hydrocolloids, or in other words, they are soluble to water, so they absorb the water. And in so doing, because of the solubility, they actually bind the cholesterol, and the cholesterol goes out into the fecal material. In fact, um, soluble fibers are viscous because of this solubility. 
They are also fermentable because of the fact that they attract water, they bind water, and because water is a favored environment of bacteria, there's fermentation that takes place. Uh, what about the transit time of stool? When we say that stool has an increased transit time, that really means that it takes longer for the stool to go through the colon. When we say in this particular case that there's a decreased transit time, that means that the time to go through the col colon is faster. Well, soluble fiber does not have that specific property. It's really the, uh, so the insoluble fibers that have that ability to decrease the transit time. Next question, what is the main health benefit associated with insoluble fiber? Stop the video here and select your answer. The answer is that it helps resolve constipation. It helps resolve constipation because of a decreased transit time, uh, because it involves the, um, uh, you know, the uh, drawing of water into the GI tract, causing a flushing effect of the stool, but it doesn't absorb the water. Here's another question. A man consumes 320 grams of sugar per day. Identify the number of pounds of sugar consumed by this man over a year. Pause the video and calculate your answer. All right, the correct answer is actually C. Let's see how I did it. So first of all, 320 grams per day and there are 365 days in a year. So 320 times 365, and that leaves you with 116,800 grams. So you know that there are 454 grams in a pound. So therefore, divide 116,800 by 454, and you get the answer, 257 pounds. Okay, this is the last question. A man consuming 1,900 calories a day would be allowed no more than how many grams of total sugar per day if he followed the recommended total maximal sugar um, controlled diet? Pause here and calculate your answer. The correct answer is A. Let's see how I calculated that answer. So 1,900 calories um, is what his DRI calories are. And we know simply that the maximal allowance for total sugar as taught in this class, which is based on National Institute of Health data, is 20%. So let's calculate 20% of 1,900 calories. So that's 1,900 times 0.2. And we divide it by 4 because remembering that sugar is a carbohydrate, 4 calories per gram, and we get 95 grams. So this is the cutoff. So now I encourage students to practice on their own. Uh, it's important to perhaps gain access to the uh, training quiz at the publisher's website. You can get there by using the access code and the web page in the inside cover of your textbook. That's one place to start. And at this stage, you would have a practice for uh, concept check two. And then I would also uh, practice similar problems that you, you've encountered in this PowerPoint and just try to build up your efficiency in completing the Mifflin and Garrier equation in a timely manner. Ooh.